Hello and welcome everybody um, to this Australian Intercultural Society Luncheon. My name is Dr Rachel Carson and I'm from the Australian Institute of Family Studies and I'll be your moderator today. I would like to begin by respectfully acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners and custodians on the land on which we meet and to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. As a researcher in the area of family law, the rights and best interests of children and young people have been very much front of mind in my work for more than 15 years. So I'm delighted to have this opportunity today to introduce and welcome our National Children's Commissioner, Megan Mitchell, and it will be a great privilege to hear her presentation today. <coughs> As a signatory to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, adopted by the UN General Assembly on the 20th of November 1989, Australia recognises rights enshrined in the Convention that are relevant to the child and family context. They include, for example, the right of children where separated from one or both of their parents to main con maintain contact with each parent where this is consistent with their best interests. And the right of children to participate in decision making affecting them by having their views heard and for their views to be given due weight in accordance with their age and maturity. While these rights have particular relevance and application in the post-separation and divorce context with which I am most familiar, these and other rights also have more general application within the context of the family. And I'm very eager, eagerly awaiting the Commissioner's perspective and reflections on this issue of children's rights within the family context. At this point, I'd like to mention that if anyone wishes to tweet about this event, please use um, the Twitter handle and hashtag on the screen. Um, that's at AusInt Society and hashtag AIS Lectures. And I would now like to introduce today's presenter. Megan Mitchell has an extensive um, experience regarding issues facing children and young people, having worked <coughs> with children from all backgrounds, including undertaking significant work with vulnerable children. Megan has practical expertise in child protection, foster and kinship care, juvenile justice, children's services, childcare, disabilities, and early intervention and prevention services. Prior to her current role as the National Children's Commissioner, Megan's role included her work as the New South Wales Commissioner for Children and Young People, the Executive Director of the ACT Office for the Children, Youth and Family Support, the Executive Director for Out of Home Care in the New South Wales Department of Community Services, and as the CEO of the Australian Council of Social Services. Megan holds qualifications in social policy, psychology and education, having completed a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Sydney, a Diploma of Education from the Sydney Teachers College, a Master of Arts in Psychology from the University of Sydney and a Master of Arts in Social Policy from the University of York. Megan commenced her term as the National Children's Commissioner at the Australian Human Rights Commission on the 25th of March 2013, a role which, in which she is focusing on the rights and best interests of children and the laws and policies and programs that impact on them. Please join me in welcoming Megan Mitchell. Thank you. thank you, Rachel, for the introduction. And thank you to the um, Australian Intercultural Society for inviting me here today um, uh, to talk to you. I too would like to begin by uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I acknowledge their uh, and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Um, I'm delighted to be here today to take part in this discussion about the importance of honouring children's rights and how families can support children to, supp to claim their rights. Apparently I've got slides, but I don't <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. Oh, clicker, clicker, good, okay. So, um, as National Children's Commissioner, I'll just tell you a little bit about my role. Uh, Rachel uh, talked a little bit about it. My role is to promote and advocate for the rights of children and young people. It's not something I can do on my own. Um, unfortunately, I don't have to do it on my own. There are many advocates uh, across the country doing great work 
to promote um, and protect children's rights. But having said this, children's rights, and I think human rights more generally, are not well understood within the community. And many children, uh, like adults, do not even realise that they have rights. Um, and this is where we can all play a much greater role by learning about and promoting children's rights within <coughs> our families, and within our communities and our workplaces. So, um, children's rights are set out, as Rachel noted, in a document called the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. And this was ratified by Australia um, in 1990. And its four guiding principles are on the screen. The right to non-discrimination, the, primary, consi the uh, primary consideration of the ch child's best interests, the right to be heard, and the right to life survival and development. These are the foundational elements of the Convention. And just so you know, the Convention is the most ratified of all international treaties. Nearly every country in the world has signed up to this. And I think this says something, at least in theory, about how much we value children. It makes it clear that children have the same rights as adults, but they're entitled to additional pro protections because of their unique vulnerabilities as children and young people. Um, since I've come into the role, I've prepared five statutory reports to Federal Parliament. Um, each has including, included the um, findings of a major investigation relating to children's rights. And also, these have contained a number of recommendations for government to improve outcomes for children. So those reports covered issues of, um, relating to self-harm and suicide among children and young people children's exposure to family and domestic violence, the treatment of children in youth detention, and the experiences, and last year I did, I looked at the experiences and needs of teen parents and their children. Um, and in each of these areas, vulnerable gr groups of children and young people, including those from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, are overrepresented and have particular needs which need to be unpacked and responded to in particular and distinct ways. And one of the key ways to, to respond to these vulnerable groups of children in, is to ensure that they have uh, ways to speak up and seek help. And we already heard a little about the right to be heard, which is Article um, 12. Uh, it's uh, in Article 12 of the Convention, and it requires that children and young people have a voice, are given the opportunity to participate in decisions that affect them, and that the views of children are taken into account. For me, this is the gateway to all other rights. And when it's realised, it's both empowering and safeguarding for children. And I'll say a little bit more about why that is the case. We all know about the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse, which concluded last year. It, um, it went for five years and it served to really shine a spotlight, a spotlight on our failings as a nation. Not only to protect children from harm, but also to uh, facilitate their voices or listen to them when they actually did say something and spoke up. And the accounts weren't just historical. In many cases, of the, the abuse occurred in recent years in a range of institutions like out of home care, in health services, schools, religious institutions, the performing arts, sporting clubs and youth groups. Um, and what emerged too was that even when a child had the courage to disclose their abuse to their families, they were frequently not believed or their families were reluctant to challenge the authority of the institutions or figureheads who were responsible. And in particular, this related to a faith-based institution who failed in their duty of care to kids. Uh, this is a quote from one survivor who, after having the opportunity to provide an account of their abuse to the Royal Commission, they said, at long last, for the first time in 26 years, I had a feeling of empowerment by telling my story to the Commissioner who allowed me to have a voice. The apology um, to those survivors um, is actually on next Monday, so I encourage you all to uh, listen to it. Um, 
Uh, and in, uh, there's still clearly a lot to be done to ensure and sustain um, the safety of our children into the future though. But in taking that agenda forward, we really need to resist uh, the urge to see children as passive victims uh, in need of our protection. Instead, we need to work alongside children on this journey and ensure their voices are elevated in this process. Uh, from my perspective, children are never too young to start learning about their rights and to know that their voice is important. Um, in uh, my role, I have, uh, I, I'm playing a part in ensuring the lasting legacy of the Royal Commission by leading the development of what we call the National Principles for Child Safe Organisations. This work supported by the Commonwealth Department of Social Services and in consultation with many child serving sectors, I've led the development of the National uh, Principle. And we're also uh, building a suite of tools uh, and resources to assist organisations across Australia um, in implementing these principles. Article 19 of the Convention also requires that we ch keep children safe from harm and violence. Uh, so in this way, the principles for child safe organisations give life, gives life to this obligation by ensuring children are safe from all forms of physical, sexual, emotional harm and neglect. So the principles have gone beyond that of the Royal Commission, which looked particularly at sexual abuse, to all forms of potential harm to children. It's, they also come from a rights-based per perspective and also a, a, a view that organisations are fundamentally pretty good for kids. Kids get a lot of benefits from them. So it comes from a strength-based perspective as well. It's just about shoring up those safety and wellbeing elements within those organisations so that what we found in the Royal Commission never happens again. Embedding child safe cultures in an organisation and within a community requires vision, leadership and, act and proactivity. Uh, in particular, the promotion of the rights of kids. Families, communities and organisations alike need to focus on the seemingly small but important things like their daily interactions with children. Some of the questions we should be asking ourselves are, do do we know what rights a child has? Do children know what rights they have? Can a, a child uh, in our sphere of family or in our work have routine opportunities to have their voices heard? And in multiple different ways because kids speak up in different ways and communicate in different ways. A key aspect of these national principles is ensuring that organisations of all kinds respect and honour families and are culturally inclusive and culturally safe. So in doing this, these organisations that care for kids need to ask themselves questions. How welcome and included do families and children from diverse backgrounds feel? What steps is the organisation taking to support parents and carers feel comfortable and informed about asking questions about child safety and wellbeing? Similarly, are our parents and carers aware of complaints processes in organisations? And does the organisation seek the feedback of families and ensure that there are opportunities for the participation of children and families in the organisation's direction or activity? As part of this project, we consulted with children and young people about what they think needs to happen for them to be safe and genuinely included in the organisations they're part of. And they were pretty vocal about the promises and commitments they want organisations to make to them um, so that they can be safe, uh, so that those places can be safe, inclusive and respectful. They spoke broadly of respect and dignity um, that young people should be treated with, how organisations should be genuine and responsible, how injustice and unfairness can be addressed because kids have a very big unfairness radar and how important it was for them to be heard. So here's just some of the things that they said when we talked to them. And we talked to kids from sporting organisations, scouts, um, settlement schools, other schools, so for a whole range of different kind of organisations. So these are the sort of the key things that they want. Treat everyone equally and fairly. Help them with their hopes and dreams. 
make places happy and comfortable, be good at what they do. They don't want people around them who don't know what they're doing. Um, that was particularly directed at teachers. Um, provide, provide access to technology and healthcare um, when they need it. And under need, understand the needs of individual children as well because we're all different. They also said that they just don't want um, adults to listen, they want them to act. The Royal Commission noted the importance of pro, uh, promoting the participation and empowerment of children and young people in organisations and how this is a protective factor that contributes to safety and wellbeing. And this should also apply within our family life. Parents and families should encourage and empower children to exercise their full suite of rights, including their right to be heard. As I often tell kids, um, being heard doesn't mean you get what you want. It just means you get heard. So for all the parents who are worried out there, it's not a competition. It really is just making sure that kids have the opportunity to say how they feel and what they're experiencing. Just a little bit more about child safe organisations, a bit of a dense thing here. But I call this the wheel of safety and I sometimes call it the flower of safety because it's got little petals. Um, but starting from the top and moving right, the first four principles emphasise getting an organisational culture right, including respect for equity and diversity, as well as children learning uh, about and enacting their rights and involving families and communities. Principles five, six and seven are the processes, the technical stuff about recruiting, training and supporting staff and dealing with concerns, complaints and incidents. And the final three principles are about the environment in which the organisation operates, including the online environment. The significant role of, fa of the family in ensuring the safety of children and young people is both recognised and embedded in the pr principles. Families can perform and should perform a major role in holding organisations to account. This goes from everywhere or thing, from a early childhood setting to religious services, holiday camps, sporting clubs and schools, everywhere that kids go. What do you know about the values, <coughs> attitudes, skills and skills of the organisations your children attend? Are you familiar with their policies in relation to child safety and wellbeing? Have staff and volunteers <coughs> been appropriately trained and screened to work with children? Do you regularly check in with children about how they feel in these spaces and places? Families have the primary responsibility uh, for the upbringing of their children and are aware of their children's primary protective networks. There is wide variety in the structure of families, the role different family members may play in a child's life, their backgrounds and their cultures. Families and carers are best placed to advise about their own children's needs and capabilities and can play an important role in informing organisations about the practices and environments that are safe for their children. And in a safe environment, children, family and community members feel that their cultures and identities are respected. Australia is a diverse multicultural society and proudly so. Individuals and families from all over the world have settled here. 28% of us were born overseas, including 10% of children and young people. This diversity is now widely recognised as delivering many social, cultural and economic benefits to the Australian community. But this also means that many who settle here come with different cultural values and can face significant challenges. Many experience discrimination, racism and communication issues. Some struggle to understand and adjust to new cultural norms, such as in relation to parenting styles and the expectations of children. Children too can have problems fitting into their new lives as members of the Australian community and to realise their basic rights and can face a number of issues that make them vulnerable, vulnerable and place them at risk. For example, language difficulties can be a barrier to learning, empl employment and social inclusion. They may, they may be subject to both direct and indirect uh, discrimination and racism. For example, some Australian studies have found that up to 80% of students from non-Anglo backgrounds report experiencing 
racial discrimination. Sensitive and accessible services are not always available, including in critical areas such as health and education. And direct breaches of a child's human rights may occur, such as for many asylum seeking and refuge, refugee children. The messages that people um, the messages that people of authority, including parents and other family members, send out to children and young people signals to them how we value them. The attention that the Royal Commission has brought to the issue of child safety means that many organisations working with children are likely to be already on their way uh, to making a start and talking about child safety and wellbeing and reorganising their um, services in ways that promote child safety and wellbeing. Implement, implementation of the national principles that I spoke of will be pivotal to ensuring all types of organisations, large and small, all, right across Australia, better respect children's rights and provide a caring, respectful and safe environment for every child and young person who comes through their doors. And when a child understands their human rights, I have found, and they understand that their human rights are respected, they in turn respect the rights of others. Over time, the challenge will be to embed these values into families and communities as well, so that anywhere a child goes, in public or private, they know they can be safe and treated well. And this is especially important as we know that most abuse occurs within the family setting, resulting in a staggering uh, just over 49,000 substantiated reports of child abuse in the last financial year. When I began uh, in the role of Children's Commissioner back in 2013 and I was the first one, so it took quite a few years for Australia to get its act together and appoint a Children's Commissioner, I conducted a national listening tour talking to children and their advocates about what was important to them and what my priorities should be in my role. And the themes that are emerged from that tour, which I called the Big Banter, I called it that to sound hip, groovy and young, but children were not uh, fooled. Um, <laughs> but these are the themes that came out of that. So, um, and, and this really has been uh, the focus of the work that I've done in all those areas that I talked about before. The right to be heard, freedom from violence, abuse and neglect, the opportunity for all children to thrive, um, so, there's, so that vulnerable groups in particular of children um, have the same opportunities as other children. Engage citizenship uh, and action and accountability so that we actually uh, monitor and, are account, and account for what we do to uh, promote uh, children's rights. I'm currently preparing a report to the Committee on the Rights of the Child and that's the group uh, under the United Nations that looks after the uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child and countries report every five years or so about how they're going and what progress they're making or not. Uh, and it's Australia's turn this year. So I, as the Children's Commissioner at the National Human Rights Institution, I get to write a report as well. Uh, that's due on the 1st of November, so I'm right in the thick of that at the moment. And clearly it's these themes in particular that I'll be focusing on in that report. And that report has also been informed by a series of consultations around the country, including with children. Children form values, mindsets, capabilities and acquire knowledge from birth. And in this journey, they're profoundly shaped by those around them, by family, by friends, teachers and others. In understanding this, how we act and how we support our children really needs to be at the centre of our thinking. Importantly, we always need to remember that they are the ultimate experts in their own lives and the go-to source for information about how things will or won't work for them. Too often as adults, we come up with ideas that impact on children that actually, uh, without actually um, talking to them, and we get it wrong. Every child and young person has a unique voice, um, things to say, fabulous insights, ideas and suggestions. One of the great joys of my uh, job is being able to talk to kids. They're full of hope and aspiration to do well and that goes no matter what their background. 
uh, and they really want to contribute to their communities. So it's up to each of us to make sure that we, make, we take the time and make the space to empower children and young people to have a say on things that impact on them and for us to adjust our thinking and behaviour and decisions as a result. Uh, each of you here is, an important, is in a unique and important position to champion the rights of children and young people. And I encourage you all to think of new ways in which you can elevate the voices of children and young people within your lives, within your families, in your communities and workplaces, and as a network committed to fostering social harmony through dialogue and to ensuring that children and young people are critical actors in that ongoing dialogue. Thank you. That's my dog, Scout. <laughs> Scout is on Instagram trying to get kids uh, to uh, learn about her rights. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs>